Good evening and welcome to the Shear for this Parshas um, Devorim, Hazoin. There is a Siam. Uh, I'm actually now in northwest London. There's a Shear in, there's a Siam in the Yeshiva uh, in, in Kingsley Way. So if I finish a couple of minutes early, that's my excuse. And um, so but let's go straight into our list of questions. So the last couple of weeks, it came up this question about using a goyrol to make a decision. And at first I had understood the wording of the Shukhan Aruch. Not to consult astrologers, nor lots, that one wouldn't be allowed to consult them for advice. And then I shared with you the uh, position of Rabbi Shlomo Kluger, who says that that's talking about asking for predictions for the future. It's not talking about it's not talking about um, making a decision for the here and the now. He says that you are allowed to. Following that conversation, that that was last week's shear. And following that, someone pointed me in the direction of a sicha from Tovshin Memtes, Parshas Bamidbor. And there's a Mugadika sicha, and then there's this, the part which wasn't included in the published sicha. And in that context, the Rebbe is talking about the pious, the goiro, which was used in the Beis Hamikdos to sort out which koyan, koyan should do which uh, avoida, and although there was an earlier stage where there was a race of the Koyanim who would get up the, to the top of the Kevesh first, and then one shoved the other and someone fell off the ramp and broke his leg, and from then they started doing with a show of hands and uh, a dipping with the, the, the pious. But Rashi actually says even the running up the ramp was also a form of goyrol. So we see that goyrol is something which is, uh, has its... A, 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 an, you know, a venerable place in Taira, in Halacha. And so the Rebbe talks about the Indian of Goyrol being in that context, the Rebbe mentions about the Minna Yisrael of using sometimes a Sefer, to open up a Sefer in a particular way and to draw a, a message from there. And then he says in a, in a note, however, to use a Sefer, which is Kodesh, to use that for a uh, mundane purpose seems to be inappropriate. To use something sacred for a mundane purpose seems to be inappropriate. And therefore, he says, find another method. It doesn't go into detail in the Muga uh, edition. In the Bilti Muga, this is what the Rebbe had said by the Fabrengen, but didn't publish. So the Rebbe says the following. This is what you have in front of you. The other Rebbe, on the contrary, when it comes to Bebiru, Binyone, Chayel, about mundane matters, if one can, one should, it should be using mundane matters themselves. And then he goes on, he says, You open the window, which opens onto the Rosh Hashanah. Not in the Mubun Ches of Shalom, Happy of Yerushas Rabbim, opposite Yechida Shalom, but the Rishus Rabbim to keep sure to open up the window to the street where people are doing mundane things. And the first thing which you will see, Vashgacha Pratis, that you will, um, you will explain and then draw from that a message of what you should do. So the Rebbe is very interesting here. He's recommending that you open the window, it's almost at random. And the first thing you see, we'll, you'll draw from this inspiration, what should be your course of action. Now, when I saw this, I was very surprised. And I'll tell you why. Because there is a lost in Gemara. Kol nachash she'enoi ke'alieze eved avroham enoi nachash. Any form of divining, which is not like Eliezer Eved Avroham is not called a Nachash, it's not called a form of divine. So we have the story of Eliezer. He wants to find a wife for Yitzchok, and he says, I'll make a sign. If I ask a maiden, 
to give me water. She will give me for me and for my for my uh, my camels. Oh, I will know this is the right one. So he had he had uh, dictated what he wants to be this simon. The uh, the uh, and then when that simon happens, so he takes that as as confirming to, to, to take a, a particular sense of direction. Then there's a halacha, there's a debate la halacha. When it says a nachash, which is not like a leaz ben Avraham, Avid Avraham, is that saying that he did what he did was right or he did was wrong? And here this is brought down in Shukhanar. In I've got here from the Lavush, but you look in the Ramah also in Kupayin Tess. Well, he says, some say that you should not be copying Elias Erevad Avraham. And that type of Nachash is forbidden. To say that I'm going to, if, if, if you're going to be a black car or a white car, whatever, that kind of, whatever kind of Nachash, and you're going to say, and that's going to dictate what, what's going to happen, what, what you're going to do. So first opinion says that's not allowed. But yes, show him that it is allowed. So what I found very strange is that I was saying about opening a window. The first thing which you see is going to be kind of an indicator of your course of action. That seems to be similar to the story of Eliezer Ebed Avram. Albeit there are those who allow it, but there are those who don't allow it. Possibly because of the uh, this uh, lack of clarity that ever took it out from the published edition. But I'd like to take it a little bit further and say the following. There's a difference between Eliezer and Avrom and what the Rebbe is talking about over here. Eliezer, and the same thing with Yonis and Ben Dovid is also mentioned over here. Yonis and Ben Shoal, sorry, with a story with the lad, with the, with the arrows. Both of them had designated the, the pointer. He had designated the first, the, the girl will say, I'll get to you. He had kind of, he had, um, he'd written the script, and the same thing with with the Onis and Menshol. They'd written the script before. Then arrows further, arrows closer. What the Rebbe is saying is not he's not saying to, that you should dictate the script. And on the contrary, he said you open up the window, and the first thing you see, then you'll take from it a, a message of inspiration. And I think there's a very big difference. Whereas the one which you are dictating the script may be comparable. Is, is, is comparable to Eliezer Ebed Avram, and that is indeed a question. But just to open and to see, to, to, to decide that you're going to see the first thing which comes to your, to your, to your eyes, and you're going to see a message from that, that's, um, I guess, um, more straightforward, La Locha, and beyond a problem. I just want to share, as I'm speaking, I know that there's a common understanding by Chassidim. When you go to the oil, and when you when you, you want to know, you ask a question where the oil wants to have advice, and you go out with the oil, the first thing which kind of which comes the first machshove, which comes to mind, to understand that as being the way the Rebbe has answered you in uh, your your uh, query at that time. Let's move on. What and all these things you should be asking, discussing with the machshia, uh, but uh, just sharing with you the. The general wisdom about this. Okay, so what happened over here? Going on to question number two. So last Motzah Shabbos is already in the nine days, and in Kitzur Shkenoruch it talks about giving the wine to a child because we're not meant to drink wine during the three weeks. Sorry, during the nine days. I remember as a child, I was looking forward to this that I will be able to drink the Havdalah wine. But my father was shown, he drank the wine himself. And from there, I, I got the impression that by Chassidim, they weren't too machmir about this, and they would make, and they would drink the wine themselves. And there were two shahs which came my way this week, related to the children drinking. One I'm going to discuss, and the other one, I'm just telling you the child, I don't have the answer. This, the other one which I'm not going to discuss is, that the child was given a glass of wine, but meanwhile, the child interrupted and spoke about this, that, and the other before actually drinking the wine. And so there, that was a shayla, whether, whether anyone was going to have dollar because the brocha of Havdola was a brocha of Atola, and the brocha of Hagofen was a brocha of Atola. So I don't know what the answer is. I'm worried. 
uh, it wasn't okay. But here, this other story is the following, that um, the, this, this particular family has only got daughters, and that's the answer. Someone asked, why did he give a girl to drink? Well, because he didn't have any boys, so he gave, and the little girl was very eager to have the uh, Abdullah wine. But uh, when it came to uh, actually sipping it, was was uh, only managed to sip a little bit. And so then the question was, Master Shabbos, are you Yotza, am I Yotza, father's asking, am I Yotza Havdola if my child didn't have Meloy Lugumov? Meloy Lugum is a cheekful. And here in Simen Kuf Tzadik, which talks all about Rocham Kois Shal Brocha, it's quite emphatic that when we, when there's a requirement to, to drink Meloy Lugumov, if you give it to a child, to drink, it has to be Maloy Lugum of Shil Cotton. And this child didn't have Maloy Lugum either, probably was uh, a wine which is not necessarily appealing to little children, uh, only to uh, adults. Okay, <clears throat> so here we have, and I'm going to give you a background to this, this uh, discussion, Shukhanov. About 300 and something years ago, lived in Holland the Reb Tzvi Ashkenazi, well known as the Chacham Tzvi. In his time, there was a Meshulach who arrived in Holland. I think in, he lived in Amsterdam. And the Meshulach arrived in Holland and became you know, And there was a Suda at where he was present. And they offered him to lead the benching. He then says, I have a bit of a problem that I am a Nazir. He had a vow of Nazirus as a Nazir doesn't drink wine. So here came the, arises the question, could he lead the benching? And at the end of the benching, someone else will take the glass of wine, make a goffin and drink it. So this, this is the question discussed in Chachmat Tzvi. In analyzing the, uh, the, this Shaila, the question is the following. When Chazal instituted a brocha on a glass of wine, we have various things by Achas and, uh, and by, uh, by Abriz and, and, and uh, by Benching, there's Christian Broche, primarily is by the Kois of Berch The question is like this Is the emphasis on the drinking of the wine or is the emphasis on the Broche? Is it the Birch or is it the Shesi Asayai? And if it's the drinking of the wine, so then it was felt perhaps that he could delegate. Someone else make a broch and drink it, that would be okay. If it's bir chasayayin, then I cannot make a broch. If you want to eat an apple, I cannot make a bayer priho eats for you to eat the apple. Because bir chasayayin has to be for yourself. You can't do it unless I'm making kiddush and being made to you with the mitzvah of kiddush, so it could also be made to you with the, with the uh, hagof, and you don't have to make accept the bracha. But for me to make a birch and for someone else, that's not okay. So if the nozir would have to make the bayer pri hagofen, and someone else would drink, that wouldn't be acceptable because you can't make a birch for another adult. And as a result, the nozir would not be able to lead the bench. So this is the question which is dealt with in the Chacham Tzvi, whether when we say, when we say birch mitzvah, sorry, um, um, is it or Another question as a result of this, uh, you know, this debate is how much wine is imperative to drink? According to the first opinion, it's, it's the drinking of the wine. And the drinking of the wine has to be, it has to be a Hoshiva amount. And how much is considered a Choshev amount has to be Meloy Lugmov. And let's read the next line. Ubepochos mishiorze loy kiye mitzvah sakois klal. If you don't drink, if no one, it can be delegated to someone else, but if no one drank Meloy Lugmov, then the whole procedure of brocha al hakois has not been fulfilled because the brocha al hakois means shesi as hakois. The second opinion says, no, when there's a requirement of do'a kois, it's 
really the main thing is the bracha, not the drinking. You have to drink because otherwise it looks like a bracha l'atom. We know that it goes further in the discussion there. If there's a bris on Yom Kippur, you give it to the, the, even the baby. The rachanimul you give to drink from the wine. The word is that really the the here is the birch asayin. The boss, uh, to make a brocha hagofen without anyone drinking doesn't doesn't look right. So there has to be a bit of a sip, but it doesn't doesn't the selection shouldn't be a brocha lavato. Shouldn't look like a brocha lavato. Oh, so here we have these two positions. Is it birch Now, according to the first position, if no one drank from the havdola cup, meloy lugmov, then you're not your to havdola. If, according to the second opinion, then even if it was just a little sip. So then the brochet wasn't in vain. And so then you yoyt to have dollar. So here we let's read over here. Vechem bahav dollar. Em loy toam kim loy lugma. Ein sorch lachzur lahav dill. Shasveik brochet shel divrei hem lohokil. If we have a dilemma whether we are fulfilling the mitzvah or not, and whether to have to make a new bracha again for for hal for for havdola, you take the lenient view, that the havdola was valid, because the main thing is the bracha. The bracha was said legitimately. A child who's the age of chinuch uh, drank from the wine, uh, even they didn't have melulugmov. According to the second opinion, that's enough. So that really seems to um, answer. As I had said, Motsu Shabbos, I hadn't. Refreshed myself on the whole the whole sugi. I remember this thing. I said that at least it's a sophic, and uh, that's indeed what their position is. Um, I'm just now, as I'm saying the shear now, I'm wondering. I'm, I'm wondering, according to what the Alter Rebbe says here in Kuf Tzadik Sibdalat, that really it's not a bracha lavatol in any case, because the main thing is bracha. And you said a bracha lai. Not possible. You have to drink. It shouldn't look like a bracha lavatol. So perhaps even in the first story, which I said. Where the child interrupted and spoke, perhaps since in, in essence it's not a brachal of atala, perhaps you are yoitza. But that, that um, I'm not really uh, going to pass a, a, a opinion on at the moment. Let's move on to the next question. Okay. Um, so here I got the following question. Someone is using an oven, a fleshika oven, and has cooked now has baked them meat. Now they've taken the meat out and they want to put in vegetables to bake. And they're asking whether those vegetables could be served with fish. And is there any need to that the oven should cool off in between one batch, between the meat and the and these vegetables which you want to serve with fish? Is there any 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 mileage gained? I want to share with you the following um, insight, which I gained through looking through this topic this week. And that is, in Simon Kufches, in Yeridea, we have a whole chapter talking about the Reicho Lav Milso, that the, that the share of a smell, a smell is not a really a significant thing. And, the fact that two things are baked in the oven and one kind of in the same oven and one has the smell from the other, that's but not such a problem. Then there's a little bit of mention of vase, of um, a vapor. Of zay, I mean sweat, but it means it means the vapor. And that seems to be not so important. Now, contemporary poskim say that changes nowadays. Because in those days, their ovens were, as we are familiar with a matzah baking oven, so you have the wood, the, the fire is there in the oven together with the food. And therefore, vapor would typically be burnt by the heat, which is in the oven. By contrast, our ovens tend to have a less uh, lebedica kind of heat, it's more controlled. And sometimes there's just heat in the oven. There's no, and there's no, um, there's no fire in the oven. And therefore, the vapor will, the condensation, etc., will be more of an issue in our ovens than the ones discussed in Shachanar. So we're taking it quite seriously. So now I've got here in front of you from the Sefer Psachim of Shuvas, and where I've underlined 
lechem ushar macholim, bread and other foods, mutala afoisum lechatchilo yachad im bosor, you would be allowed to bake them at the same time as meat, even as long as they're not touching, even though you intend to eat them with fish, the bread with fish, if the meat is a dry type of food and it's covered, so then the vapor of the meat is quite contained, and then you could bake this, this bread in the same oven together with the meat which is covered, with the schnitzel, whatever, that would be okay. And he says, but the same token, you would be able to bake a bread at the same time as fish in the oven, even though you want to subsequently eat that bread with meat. So if it's not a juicy uh, fish, it's a more dry type of fish, and it's covered, so the point being that if the vapor is contained, because it's covered, and there's not a lot of vapor in the first place because it's a dry type of food, then we're not worried about them both being in the oven at the same time. Certainly, one after the other would not be a, prop, a, a problem. That's, that's what I can see. I don't see any benefit in cooling down the oven in between. Um, if they were, and, and, and again, I know if one is after the other, I'm not sure whether you can when you make an issue of the Zayo. I just want to say one other um, thought about this. Um, it's a bit, perhaps a bit revolutionary, but what's the big deal of you to actually tasting it? You're saying it's flay, it's got the taste of meat and you mustn't have it with the fish or the vice versa. Taste it. Taste it and see. Okay. Um, right. Let's let's take a look at the couple of questions which we have before going to the next point. The Nichush of Yoinusen was um, to, if the Plishtim would say um, to wait or come. It was not with the arrows. Oh, thank you. Um, my, my, I guess it's my mistake. So you, you, your Rabbi Singer is pointing out that we say the Nachash of Yoinusen was something with the um, the reaction of the Plishtim, which uh, whether he should. How should he should respond to them? Someone is asking um, this week, if not fasting, what does one drink? So that's up to you if you want to use Hamar um, um, uh, Medina, you want to make a, a cup of coffee, that's fine. Um, if you want to, there are different opinions. And so which, whichever way you do, you, you know, you're showing me this way. Whether it's better to do um, Dafka on wine, if you're always particular to do on wine. And you had to make havdalah on, on Tishabov, so you you can use wine if necessary, because you're doing it limits for not you're doing it for time. Okay, so question number four is that someone uh, shliach somewhere in Europe is having a, an Israeli sports team coming to town, and he's wondering about. Is it appropriate to be there at the sports event? Of course, to put on film with people and to and to uh, give out Neil Chavez, etc. Now, years back, about to, 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 ten years ago, is it more? I published in Chnesivim Bzdeashlichus Volume Two, and I had written there that you're not allowed to partic participate in a, um, a, a, in a show. A Goyesha show, whether it's a theater, a circus, a sports event. I took this from the Rashi in in, in Sefer Vayikra on the words of Achui Kiseyem Loisei Leichu. It says, Rashi, Mahi Niach HaKosav Shlei Amor, Omar. What, it's gone through a whole list of things. So what's the Achui Kiseyem Loisei Leichu? Elo Eilu Nimusos Shel Haknanim. These are their cultural events. Dvorim Shach HaKukim Lohem. To go to a theater and to a stadium, that's included in Vukhukis. That's what the Torah adds. And then we have lower down, quoting here from the Mishnah Brura in Simashi and Zion, 
and he laments, well, Arsenu Harabim, it's become, this matter has become hefkir by various people to go to theaters, and the Torah says, Al Tisnach Yisroel El Gil Amim. You shouldn't be um, rejoicing with the, the rejoicing of the nations. So, what, so the, the, I see there's a difference between going to a park, going to an amusement park even. Amusement park, you, you are entertaining yourself. But when there is a, a, a show and everyone is kind of focusing and everyone's cheering and you're part of that cheering, that is where the Apostle says, Artismach Yisrael, Gil Amim, don't join, join in in their celebration. And that's what the Rashi is saying. That's included in Kuchuk Yisem Leiselech. Now, having said that, there is a shuva of Reb Moshe Feinstein. And he says, he was asked this question, is Bechuk Yisem Leiselech, does that include going to a theater, to a stadium, a sports event? And he takes the view that Bechuk Yisem Leiselech would only be when there is some kind of religious worship association. Even though it's not mamish and part of worship, but it's in yoni chukim in higu beneim, not just priests. Um, so he gives a reference to uh, that the, you know, if a guy wears trousers, that doesn't mean that you didn't aren't allowed to wear trousers. It's when it's when the goyim are doing something which is perhaps uh, irrational, and why are they doing it? Because that's the uh, that's the goyish culture. So that kind of thing we would say. But he's saying that the sports event is not doesn't come into this category because it's got no religious um, background at all. I well, I, I find it very difficult to understand where he's coming from. I have very difficult to accept that Rashi, when he says not to go to a theater, to a stadium, and that the, his theaters and stadiums were of religious background. I would have understood that they were there for entertainment, um, or however, you know, mushkas that entertainment was, but it was for entertainment, not for any religious background. And still Rashi says not to go there. So it was uh, last year, Two years ago, there was a particular role, uh, prominent Rav in Israel, American in business, uh, Rav in Israel, and he was visiting the United States, and he took his grandchildren to um, to some baseball game, and he was caught on camera sitting with his Yerushalmi, <laughs> I guess with his capota and all, but he was caught sitting there with his Yerushalmi uh, at this sports event. Uh, he, and he was later interviewed, and he was, uh, I guess, following the issue, the position of Ramosha. But even Ramosha Feinstein, if you read a little bit further, he says it definitely comes into the gather of Moshe of Leitzim, etc. He certainly doesn't recommend it. And I'm sure that Rosh Hashiva is not going to do it again in the, in the uh, near future. Um, but at any rate, so this is, I find it difficult to accept that um, a sports event doesn't fall into what Rashi has said over here. That doesn't mean, though, that the Shliach shouldn't go there and meet Yidden. It's an Israeli team coming to, uh, to play against a team in Europe. So there's lots, going to be lots of Yidden there, Baruch Hashem, a bit of Jewish pride, and to uh, utilize the event uh, for, uh, for being a film, etc. I don't see any objection to that. But uh, to actually go there, let's shame, let's shame uh, the, the game is, uh, yeah, questionable. Okay. I got a very interesting question. It's last Shabbos, and in a small community, the tenth man arrives at eleven thirty. By then, they'd already done Shabbos. They didn't do Kriya Satayra because they didn't have a minion. Uh, so the tenth man arrives, and the ninth man says, "But I can't stay more than ten minutes." So now we have a dilemma. Are we going to do Kriya Satoira? And obviously Kriya Satoira, last week, Matas Masse, you wouldn't manage in 10 minutes. So you're going to rely on starting on, starting the Kriya Satoira with 10, and then you got some exhaust on, and then you continue doing that Kriya Satoira. 
Uh, or do you do Musaf, which probably you could manage Musaf in 10 minutes. And this was the dilemma. We have now 10 people, we have 10 minutes. Do we do Musaf or do we do, do, do we begin Kriya Satoya? This is the question. And the person was very succinct the way he presented the question. It's quest the question is, let's say, if a person is confined to a hospital or Islam, and he's allowed out for half an hour, should he go for Kriya Satoya or should he go for the oven? I know you can't do Kriya Satoya on your own, but you know what you can't do to fill a Batsib on your own either. They're both communal uh, activities. And both of them, the actual content you could do on your own. So this is a question which actually I, I found that was already addressed um, in Mincha Sitzchok by uh, the later of Weiss. And he takes the view, now the upper quote is from the Sefer Isha Yisrael, an excellent Sefer on Hilchus Tefillah, where he says, a choyle who's given the opportunity to leave the house just for a short while, and he has a choice of Tibur, or at Kriya Satoira, you should go for Tefillah with Tibur rather than Kriya Satoira. Now, that's, so although others disagree, and in the Isha Yisrael, he gives other sources in Sefer Lekar Akema, who does say that Kriya Satoira should take precedence, but the Poyal Min Chasitzchok passes at Tefillah with Tibur, so that's in, it's Musuf rather than Kriya Satoira. Another weight to uh, the argument to do um, to do Musaf rather than Kriya Satoya is the following. How legitimate is it to start off a session of whatever it may be, Tefillah or Kriya Satoya, and rely that you know that the 10th man is going to leave, but you know that the halacha is that you can continue that session. Therefore, look at Chila to start off knowing that, knowing full well that you're going to have to rely on Yotsu Miksos when you're allowed to finish. So here we have a quote from um, from Piske Chuvas and Simon on Hay. That's the whole thing, Simon about minion of uh, how to come, what constitutes a minion, etc. And he writes, he's got sources that one shouldn't, not one shouldn't be starting a filler with a minion if you know from the outset that during during this filler someone's going to leave. And then he says, Bashar Satchak, you could rely on this. So, all right, so it's, it's really not so straightforward. To do as a Kriya Satoira, you're going to have now separate brochures again and all without a minion. It's, 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 it's questionable. And therefore, I, I'm, I'm, since you have a choice whether to do Musaf or whether to do um, Kriya Satoira, this helps me sway towards saying do Musaf in the 10 minutes which you have. And Kriya Satoira, okay, you'll, everyone can take a Chumash and read the, read the uh, parasha. Okay, let's move on to our next question. This is a little bit of a recycle. And there's a young man who's amazingly um, undertaken to start writing down trans I mean, contend, transcripts of previous theory. So in case you do remember, I'll give you that date. It was Parsha Slef Lachor in Tov Shin Pei Aleph. That's uh, about 18 months ago, where we discussed about um, using food for non-food purposes. Let's say we discussed about taking potatoes and cutting them out to use as stamps for the children to be able to stamp paint uh, to keep them entertained, etc. So what the parameters of using food for, um, for other things. And, and I, a fellow pointed out to me, there are some who have this uh, custom of, on Tisha B'Av, they're worried that people will become too morose, so they start throwing things. So some places here, they used to throw um, the berelach, which are these prickly things which grow in the, in the in brambles, but some places they're using beans. So the beans are, are eminent cholent beans, and now they're being used for throwing around, and very unlikely, they will end back into the charm pot. They'll probably be swept up and thrown into the bin. So here's the question, are you allowed to use food for entertainment? So I know we discussed it, we're gonna go just over, over it briefly. So we have in Simon Kuf Ayin Aleph, 
in Erechaim talks about using food. You're allowed to use food. Let's say you can't dip your bread in, in uh, the soup. You can use your bread to wipe the soup and then eat it. That's okay. Um, now here the Mogna Vrohom is saying the following. Mukach begemora, bekama duchter, that you're allowed to sprinkle wine in your house along on the floor. They used to make this to make a nice smell in the house. You could use it for other domestic uses other than drinking. You can use it also for anointing, even if it's not for medical reasons. Now, he, then he says the reason why this is permitted, because the Rambam words this, he says, you're not allowed to waste food in a disgraceful way. Um, but if it's something which is, it's a for human need, so that's not called in a disgraceful way, and therefore you are allowed to. And then he quotes from Gemara Shabbos, Hefzid Oichlin. But if there is a legitimate use, so then it says there is a Torah Ha'odom, then that's not called wasting. And you say you have to use food for a non food use, but if it's a, it's a legitimate use. So now let's, toward the end of that simon, the simon Kuf Ein Aluk, it says that they used to have a custom of throwing grains of wheat in the celebration of a chasana, in front of the chasana. So the Shukhanor says that they should only be thrown in a clean space and to be swept up afterwards so that they shouldn't be trodden upon. It doesn't say they have to put in the chom, but it says that they should be, they, these scattering these grains of wheat should be in a clean place, otherwise it's disgracing food. So to use grain as a kind of confetti, that's what he's uh, addressing over here. And he says it has to be in a way that it shouldn't get disgraced. In the Mishnah Brewer, and he's on the Bir Aloch is a bit more um, uh, um, elaborate about this, he says the following. If it's normal for people to use food for this other purpose which you're using it for, that's also okay. And as a result, that's the justification for the sprinkling of wine and for the anointing of the body with the wine or oil. So it's slightly different, which to the Mogen Avraham, and when Avraham has said, Soyrecha Adam, Mr. Brewer has added another element. It's, it's, a, it's a common behavior, which is a very interesting. How does it become a common behavior? Um, right. Finally, we have here a quote from the Ben Ishchai, and he has a, a case, he talks about where he laments the fact in his community, the night before a bris, they will have a, a, a whole flower display. And in order to support the flowers in this display, they would make a dough, and they would use this as like the uh, foam, where we'd have a, nowadays a flower display, they would use a, a dough to hold it together, or they would take a fruit, it doesn't, and it says a word in a fruit called numi, which I don't know uh, what that means, a sweet fruit or a pomegranate, and use that as the base for sticking in the flowers. And he says the food becomes disgraced. And therefore, once she sorch limchois, he says one should object that shouldn't use food in a way that the food is disgraced. All right, so we're seeing here using food, and as you're using it, the food gets disgraced. That's not okay. Um, coming, coming back to the the beans, are the beans being actually spoiled when they're thrown? I don't know, but we do say, we see even by the chitim, by the grain, by the grains of wheat, he says you can only throw them by mokim noki. Um, so I don't really find a clear header for throwing beans which are edible um, in, and throwing them in a place in a way that they are going to be and not in a mokim noki, and they're not going to be swept up. I think that is a problem. Fine. The famous story, which is quoted in, in uh, Sefer Hamin Hogim, about the the, the Ruzhin, that in the Ruzhin there was some of this kind of playing around the Tishabo, and they had a, a trick that they lowered a bucket. Whoever would come in, the bucket would fall on their head, and they would then pick him up in the bucket. Somehow, I don't know how they managed that. 
I'm curious. Um, but meanwhile, they did this trick on the next person who came in, and it happened to be the Rebbe, the, the Bisrael of Ruzin. And so when they saw that, they quickly but carefully lowered him down. And the Ruzina then says, if it's a tate, you know, Father in heaven, your children, you gave your children a yomtu. And they don't know how to look after, to how to keep this yomtu properly. Take it away from them. Let's move on. So here a question was put to me. I don't have a clear source, but the question was put to me that uh, a woman says her mother's gravestone has the, the name wrong, her name and her father's name, Shmayo, Shmario, some other, some mistakes. Is it a duty to correct the, the mistake on the gravestone? So my feeling was about it, that a gravestone is a kind of a document for posterity and it should be correct. And therefore, it should be correct. I know it's sometimes an expense, perhaps to put aside money eventually to, to uh, correct it. I thought of perhaps, I don't know practically whether that's possible to take a, a plaque, a plastic plaque, and, and put that, have that engraved and put that on, onto the marble. Um, if that would last, I don't know. But meanwhile, I want to share with you a story of Rabbi Isaac Hommel. Um, so here's the story of Rabbi Isaac Hommel. That in Hommel, it was the Minhag that on, on Lag Boimer, there would be a, the Bechebra Kadisha would go to the, um, to the cemetery and they would go around and check the uh, condition of the cemetery, if there needs any, any fixing up. After they finished their survey of the cemetery, then they'd go to a side room, uh, whatever, and they would have there, now they're not in the cemetery itself, and they would have their Suda, the head of Fabrengen over there. Rabbi Isaac Hommel, he was a uh, very eminent hostage of the Mitzel Rebbe. He was a Robin in Hommel. So after the survey, and they made this Fabrengen, so then they would send a carriage, and the Rav would come, and he would join in this Fabrengen for a little while, and then you go back. So then he would say, uh, uh, one time he came like Beimer, he came, then he, he entered the base island, and he stopped by a particular gravestone. He, wrote, he saw the inscription on the gravestone. He stood there for a little while and thought. And then he turned to the head of the uh, Ed Shamash of the Hever Kadisha. He says, from heaven, they're asking this person that with the deceased, where are all those virtues? written on the gravestone, where all, you know, show where you have uh, all those virtues. He started, a bit, uh, he, he waited a bit longer and he said, bring an ax. Then the, the uh, Gabba, the shamans brought an ax and Rabbi Isaac told him to chop out those words, that inscription, those, the, the, those questionable uh, words, to chop them out from the gravestone. Once he finished, then Rabbi Isaac went and joined the Fabrengen, and he says, may I be rewarded, I did a tremendous toiver for this, for this deceased, I did him a tremendous favor. Now, that's, this is the story written by Rav Zevin in, in Sipur Echsidim. Now, it's not the same. There was a, 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 a virtue which was not, not deserved, and that was the problem. Here we're talking about an inaccurate um, name, etc. Nothing criminal about that. But I still think that uh, we see that there's, there is a emphasis on making sure that a gravestone is uh, is correct. Okay. Um, Rabbi Singh is, is suggesting that the story was with, with the in erosion was with a lasso. Okay. Sounds more likely, uh, although a bit more dangerous. Fine. Okay. So here, someone put a question number eight is someone asks me that she attends a, a Zoom uh, shear, a regular Zoom shear, and one of the participants there isn't Jewish, but her here, the spouse is Jewish, a man or a woman, but the, the non-Jews whose spouse is a Jew is also aware at this, um, and joining in on a regular basis. The rabbi is aware of this person's status, but um, I'm not comfortable about this. 
And so am I being overly sensitive? So this is her question. So what I responded to the questioner is that as perhaps I've said this before, as a policy, I don't answer Reuven Shimon's question. I, I, I have a, this uh, belief that a person owns his child. It's your right to decide whether to ask the question or not. Um, so in this case, whose Shaila is it? I think it's more the rabbi's Shaila than, any, uh, than uh, the participants. Having said that, let's take a look at the question. So we're talking objectively rather than what this person should be doing or not. So the question about giving a Shia when non-Jews will be there, when we are not allowed to talk, not allowed to teach Torah to a guy. So actually this question first came up to my knowledge, by um, Moshe Feinstein, where Rupinchus Tights, Allah Vashalem, would give a weekly shear in Gomorrah on the radio. And that was in Yiddish. At, at, at a particular stage, the Rabbi Tights' son started doing a shear on the radio, a weekly shear in English. And then came the question, but who it could be that they're going to be going also listening to the radio. And he asked the question to Reb Moshe Feinstein. And Reb Moshe took the view that so long as you're, you're giving a shear to your desired, your intended audience, which are Yidden, the fact that there's going to be Goyim listening also, uh, un which is not your intention, that you can you could uh, overlook. That's Reb Moshe's uh, position. I, again, I looked up this safe as this Sokim at Shubhas, so he brought me to another, even more recent sefer, called Shevet HaKahosi. And he has this very similar question to our own question, is someone saying he travels often to France to do Kir of Ruchoykim. Doesn't sound like Lubavitch or Dafka, but fine, doesn't matter. There's enough work for everyone. And he gives shiurim. And in one of the cities where he gives a shir, he gives shiurim, there are those who are intermarried. And many times, uh, uh, yeah, there'll be a, uh, a, a Jewish woman will come and her Goisha husband, and you can't stop them from coming. And, but most of the people present are you. So this was the question, which is very, very similar. Um, and he inspired by Rav Moshe. He says, you're doing the right thing. You're giving your shia. The fact that there are, if a Goy is not meant to learn Torah, that's their lookout rather than yours. And... And therefore, uh, you, you should, you're, you're focusing on, on, on spreading Torah to Yidden. The fact that the guy comes in and listens, that's, that's not so much your business. Uh, just one more uh, po positive note, Shh. more on a, on a uh, perhaps stra strategy. Perhaps it's it, by, by, um, by being more welcoming to this. They're, they're, they're married, a ma 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 Jew and a non-Jew are married. The, if the if the non-Jew non-Jew spouse will be more uh, happy about understanding Yiddish guide, the likelihood they'll have a hashpor on the Jewish spouse, and hopefully both of them will come closer, one through Geirus and one through Poshet Bimiskar. So there may be there an element of strategy to be welcoming, and one has to be careful, though, of course, to to give them directly. Uh, in Yonim of Torah, Torah Shabal Peh particularly, one has to be careful. But uh, I can see possibly that's why the rabbi is is um, is kind of tolerant of this and not saying you can't join in because he sees this as a view, as a, his tolerance is a, as, a, as a method of reaching to the Jewish spouse to get close. Let's move on to the next question. Um, yeah, this is interesting. Uh, about taking this, there are these vitamins in English we call them, in England we call them vitamins, which help you um, fast better. Somehow it builds up some kind of energy in the body and it makes the body able to cope with the fast better. So this person writes to me that they use them every time before the fast, but here the question is about taking them on Shabbos. So here's actually two questions. One is about taking medicine on Shabbos. One doesn't take medicine on Shabbos unless matzav of uh, a sakana, bedridden. The other question here is, 
So these are two questions. And I'm going to tell you that I saw this early in the week. And then I, I was looking, where did I see this? And I looked up in two other sources or three other sources. And they said, you're not allowed to. Both I saw Nita Gavriel. And I saw also in Piskit Shuvis in uh, the dinim of uh, Tishabal. And then perhaps in the third, third, third source. But I, I, and then I remembered where I, I did see this. This is in, in, in the uh, Piskit Shuvis in the newer edition. The edition of Tufshin Ein Hay for seven years ago. And here he's dealing with an interesting question. We're not going to take medicine or Shabbos. Medicine means for someone who's ill. What happens if I'm perfectly okay? I just want to take a, a, a medicine for a well person. I just want to get a boost of energy or something. So he writes the following A healthy person is taking medicines of sorts, pills of some sort, let's say um, for insomnia or to help them find out fast. Let's say a person's overweight and so taking a medicine will help them lose weight. Um, could be, you know, it suppresses their, uh, their appetite. So that these are not medicines for ill people. They are healthy people, but they have a problem which can be solved with a type of medicine. Is that included in the issue of taking medicines on Shabbos? So he's taking the view at the moment that that is okay because it's not it's, it's not a medicine for an ill person therefore it's not included in the issue of taking medicines on Shabbos in the following paragraph he says not everyone agrees with that and therefore he's like suggesting recommending to blend this uh, medicine into so some food before Shabbos I guess and to eat it in, inside another food be that as it may, we do certainly have a header here to take those medicines. Now, um, in the footnotes, he brings a couple of points here. He brings it from the Sefer Migdonis Elio, which I've never seen the actual Sefer, but I'm very impressed by the quotes, which I see from him. He, was, he became the Rav in Antwerp, um, uh, and he passed away very shortly afterwards, sadly. And seems to be an excellent... Um, um, Shiva Sefer, very practical. And he says, um, he's a healthy person. He, do, he doesn't fast very well. The effect of the tablet or the drops is to, to muster energy in the, to the body that it shouldn't um, dissipate quickly. And therefore, it's not called healing an illness. What about Shachon Mishabas Lechoyl? Where he says, well, actually, you want the effect now. And so, therefore, you want to be now feeling more energized, number one. Number two, we have a, uh, a, an interesting um, heter about hachon Shabbos l'choyl. If that is not going to be available at night, let's say, on, uh, there's a, let's say to, to, fetch, to fetch wine from the cellar, but at night is going to be in part for, for, for whatever, let's say, someone... There's a story about milk, bringing milk from the milk parlor to the house. And by night, that's not going to be possible. Are you allowed to bring it now? Because you say it's hachon. I'm not doing it because I want to save time later. It's not going to be effective later. Uh, not going to be possible later. So then some say that's not called a problem of hachon. That's, so that's why he's, he uses these arguments to say it's okay. Then he quotes of you know, sort of Shlomo Zalman, who takes a totally different heter. Very interesting. We, you are allowed to take medicine if you are bedridden. Now, this person, if they don't take the medicine, so they will become bedridden tomorrow. So therefore, he's preempting. What's the difference of taking it before you're bed, before you bedridden or, uh, or after you're bedridden? You're taking it that you shouldn't become a choyla, sheba sarkona. Also, on that basis, he says, you are allowed to take medicines on Shabbos. Even if you do call it to medicine, that makes it easier. I mean, because of this thing about the argument of mixing with another food. But Reb Shlomo Zalman says you're allowed to take it. Who says it's only if you're a chayla today? It'll be tomorrow also, um, and you can't deal with it later because it's tishu bov. You you'll be fasting. So from both sides, we have we have a heter. So the bottom line remains that um, yes, there are heter to use. If you are using this same cow thing, you have a heter to use it. Um, 
Okay, uh, going back to the previous question, I'm told that the person giving the shia uh, with a non with a terror class, whether there's with, is it a woman? All right, I still think that the um, principle of whoever gives the class it's their prerogative to make to make the to ask the question. But all right, you can certainly give them a link to this shia um, subsequently. Finally, finally, um, people are asking about washing clothing for Shabbos. And so here we have, this is in uh, Mishnah Bura is saying, Lechvot um, Shabbos, you'd be allowed to wash clothes on the Thursday or the Friday. Um, but if, if that's talking, if you don't have a shirt for Shabbos, then you would be allowed to wash a shirt today. And then if you're giving it to a goy to do, then for sure that it would be allowed. By contrast, having a haircut in honor of Shabbos, that definitely is not allowed. The difference being that uh, people do wash clothes on a weekly basis, or they don't have haircuts on a weekly basis, and therefore the haircut will wait for afterwards. Um, I don't know what I told you, I think I mentioned it last week. I heard from the Rebbein of Padua of Asholem that in Vienna, there were these, these, uh, these uh, Grace of Balabat and these millionaires, and they were very frustrated. They had their, they couldn't shave during the three weeks. So whenever there was a bris of a poorer family, there'd be a, a whole line of queue of, of Balabatim offering to be sanding and pay for the whole lot so that they should be able to have a, have a shave look over the, yeah, that's the bris. I'll clap on him. Um, we'll stop here and wish you all a good Shabbos and a Yehofech Lesimcha. And uh, we should see Binan Besamindosh. Uh, in good health and Malkina Barashena also. Amen. Good.